Chapter 31 You are listening at NovelFull.audio The Equilibrium Between Man and Dragon Translator Endless Fantasy Translation Editor Endless Fantasy Translation, my lord, we've managed to gather 1,232 cavalrymen. Excellent. Ardarian stretched out his hand. Bring me my sword. Schwing, Ardarian pulled out his sword. The hum of steel was long but delicate. He closed his eyes as if he was appreciating a musical instrument. Even though the days of war were long gone, every time he heard the sound of a sword being unsheathed, the hair on his back would stand up. At first glance, the long sword looked like a work of art. It was forged out of bright dot-colored steel and it had a golden hilt. Dot back in the years of war, he had relied on this long sword to slaughter and bathe in the blood his countless enemies. However, now that they were at peace, his long sword had instead become a symbol of his authority. It was an insignia of his position as the ruler of Longsong Alley. His territory, Longsong Alley, was the northernmost city of the kingdom. It was an industrious region, and its main economic activity was the mining of copper ores. Upon processing, they would export their copper in exchange for wheat and cloth from the south. Life was considered to be pretty good there. If one were to continue heading north from Longsong Alley, they would encounter several small villages, followed by a vast desert that contained enough sand to bury the kingdom several times over. Should they survive their arduous trek across the perilous desert, they would then come face dot to dot face with a seemingly endless plain of snow. Since there were no enemy regions in the north, no troops were stationed in Longsong Alley. That was, until a dragon descended upon them one day. In less than a year of its initial arrival to the desert region, it had managed to hunt down all the creatures living there. Once the creatures of the desert had been hunted to extinction, it then attacked the camels within the villages. Once the villages had run out of camels, it began to hunt the villagers. The appetite of the dragon constantly grew. Sooner or later, the villages would be annihilated by the dragon, and once that happened, the dragon would undoubtedly set its sights on Longsong Alley. In order to prepare for the upcoming threat, Ardarian rapidly developed the military industry. Within the span of a few years, he had managed to churn out his first batch of troops. At the price of sacrificing the villages, Ardarian had managed to muster a force to resist the dragon. Currently, there were over 2,000 foot soldiers garrisoned in Longsong Alley. They were considered to be the first line of defense, as well as cannon fodder. Should the dragon lay siege to the city, the foot soldiers would thrust their pikes in an attempt to pierce the dragon's reverse scales. The reverse scales were the only weakness of a dragon. They were unlike the other impervious scales that covered a dragon's body. Everyone knew that the adult dragon's body was covered with tough scales. As for the composition of the scales, no one had yet to research it. The reason was simple. Dragon scales were expensive and rare. They were usually used to make armor strips that protected vital organs. On top of that, very few humans had actually possessed the strength to crack open the dragon scales. As such, research on this matter could hardly proceed. Nevertheless, based on the experience of veteran soldiers, ordinary swords and sabers were completely ineffective against dragons. Rather than injure them, attacking with those weapons only infuriate the dragons, and it would escalate a situation that could be solved via diplomacy into a life dot and dot death situation. As for bows and arrows, even if they were equipped with the heaviest armor, piercing bullets, they were still incapable of penetrating the tough scales of the dragons. Using magic to defeat dragons was an even laughable proposition. Almost every shade of chromatic dragons possessed an element that they excelled in manipulating. For those particular elements, no ordinary human mage would ever dare to compete against them. Before the magic of the dragons, the magic of humans was akin to drilling wood to start flames. All that was left was to use light cavalry. In fact, throughout the centuries dot long conflict between dragons and humans, light cavalry had been humanity's greatest weapon in fighting the dragons. Imagine a dragon that was a few meters tall and a few tons in weight. Other than the reverse scales on its neck, 
it had no other weakness. When it flew, it would easily exceed the range of bow and arrows. When it opened its mouth, it was capable of releasing dragon breaths that could raise entire cities to the ground. With a simple chant of its obscure dragon tongue, it could unleash magic that far surpassed that of humans. It was impossible to beat such an enemy via a frontal assault. Thus, the humans were motivated to discover a second weakness of the dragons aside from their reverse scales, treasure. Compared to the greed of humans, the dragons' love for treasures far exceeded them. Mountain dot like treasury. Gold, gems, weapons, nothing was excluded from the desire of dragons. Dragons would hoard all their treasures in their lairs, and at times, they would even bury themselves in treasures to sleep. In the eyes of dragons, the treasures were worth even more than their own lives. As a result, the humans formed the light cavalry tactic to take advantage of the dragon's love for treasure. The first step of their tactic was to locate a dragon's lair. Then, they would have a few groups of light cavalrymen lie in ambush nearby all year round. Once the dragon had left its lair, the light cavalrymen would need to be on their guard. Should they spot a human settlement with smoke rising from it, it meant that the dragon was currently invading the settlement. Immediately after noticing this, the light cavalrymen would then use their mobility to their advantage. They would enter the dragon lair, plunder the dragon's treasure, slaughter their young, and commit arson. Usually, their rule was only to take away half of the treasure. Then, they would kill all the young dragons and arrange them in the cave in the cruelest configuration possible. Then, the light cavalrymen would split up, with each person taking a portion of the treasures, and run in different directions. The final result would be mutually assured harm. An ordinary settlement would not have the strength to withstand the dragon's attack. At worst, the settlement would be razed to the ground, and as a result, many would die or be left homeless. However, the dragon would suffer pain of equal proportion as well. Upon its return to its lair, it would realize that half of the treasures that it had painstakingly collected were gone. Worse still, all of their dragon hatchlings were tortured and killed in the lair. The humans would leave the corpses of the dragon hatchlings in the cave, even though they were very valuable. This was done on purpose, as it would serve to provoke the dragon, and at the same time, allow the dragon to experience the loss of family. At this point, depending on the personality of the dragon, some dragons would choose to commit suicide on the spot. After all, with their treasures gone, they no longer had a reason to live. On the other hand, some dragons would lose their rationality and fly to the next settlement to take revenge. However, if the dragon were to do so, the light cavalrymen would rush back into the dragon's lair and take away yet another portion of the dragon's treasures. Depending on the situation, they would even take away the corpses of the dragon hatchlings, naturally, most dragons' first reaction would be to chase after the light cavalry. However, no matter how fast the dragon flew, they could not catch all of the light cavalry that had spread out in different directions. Those light cavalry were not afraid of death at all. Once they discovered that they were being chased by the giant dragons, they would commit suicide on their horses to prevent the dragons from finding out the whereabouts of their other teammates. There were even some light cavalrymen who would leave one of their arms in the cave and deliberately lure the dragon to them with the smell of blood. If they were to employ this tactic, the cavalrymen who sacrificed themselves would not be carrying any treasure, and would instead leave it with the rest of their teammates. This process would be rinsed and repeated until the dragon realized that attacking human cities was highly uneconomical for it. Thus, the weak humans had finally found a bargaining chip that was capable of threatening the dragons at the cost of their own lives. Such is the subtle equilibrium between man and dragon, who both resided on the same continent. Chapter 32 You are listening at NovelFull.audio in the face of a dragon, you are but an ant. Translator Endless Fantasy Translation Editor Endless Fantasy Translation However, in order for the tactic to succeed, strict requirements would have to be imposed for those who wish to be part of the Light Cavalry Unit. In essence, they needed to be veterans who were unafraid of death and had rich combat experience. 
After all, once deployed, most of them would not be able to return. Some of the light cavalrymen would even be corrupted by the treasures of the dragon. They would steal the treasures and live a carefree life by themselves. The bar of entry was high, their job was highly risky, and they could only be deployed once in most cases. As such, Ardarian had went through great difficulty to train these cavalrymen. Once the ordeal was over, the 1,200 cavalrymen would most likely be reduced to 10 or so members. Ardarian walked to the front of the military formation and raised his sword. Boom, boom, more than 1,000 cavalrymen responded to the Lord's salute. They knocked their pikes on the ground, and the warhorses under them neighed. My brave soldiers! Ardarian opened his arms and began his speech. I trust that all of you are familiar with the three heroes of the Pandey Kingdom, Tahir, Rafiq, and Karvela. Respectively, they are the role models of mages, amiable warriors, and beautiful heroines of our great kingdom. However, they have been put to eternal slumber within the desert to the north of Long Song Alley. Their bodies remain unfound until now, and they are still slowly rotting away in the wind and sand. Answer me. Who is responsible for this vile act? Ardarian's voice was pale but powerful, and the soldiers' answers echoed in the sky, dragons. Good. Aldarian continued roaring, all of you present here are humanity's greatest weapons against dragons. Are you mentally prepared to play the responsibility imposed on you? Yes. 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 Under the lead of their mother, Max and Mia were heading towards the south. Slowly, the scenery on the ground changed from a desert where it was difficult to find even a blade of grass to an oasis that could be seen occasionally. After flying south for a while, forests gradually came into view, and humans were more commonly sighted. Sometime later, Max appeared in front of what seemed to be a human city. From his lofty position in the sky, the city looked no larger than the little bird beside him. However, based on his prior knowledge as a human, Max was certain that the city was rather huge. The city was built against a mountain. The mountain was like a palm that held up the entire city. A river flowed down from the mountain and ran through the entire city. From his position in the air, Max heard a vague chant coming from the ground. It sounded as if a group of people were shouting in unison. Agatha turned around. This is called Long Song Alley. Let's head down. Then, the three dragons swooped down toward the city. Upon landing on the city walls, the impact from Agatha's huge body immediately blew up several houses. Moreover, the guards on the city wall had also been blown away. However, as Max had already expected such a scene, he pulled Mia back to avoid being hurt by the impact of their mother's landing. Roar, Agatha stood on the city wall and looked down at the city. Then she raised her head and let out a loud roar, as if announcing her arrival to the entire city. Even Max was incapable of withstanding such a strong sound wave. He quickly covered his ears with his hands and covered Mia's ears with his wings. After all, his klutzy sister's reaction was always slightly delayed. He did not know whether or not it was an illusion, but Max saw that the mountain trembled together with his mother's roar. Water droplets jumped up from the river surface as if it was about to boil. It's a dragon. Quick, run. God, please save me. Long Song Alley immediately fell into a state of panic. Most of the people saw the figure of the dragon were stunned for a second. Then, they turned around and ran like ants. One by one, they rushed to the other side of their city, hoping to escape from the dragon's wrath. Some of the weaker humans went mad under Agatha's roar. They crumpled on the ground and began muttering incoherent nonsense. Roar, like his mother, Max also roared. However, as a young dragon, Max's roar naturally not as loud as his mother's. If his mother's roar was described as earth dot shattering, then Max's roar was like an irritating alarm. Roar, after watching her brother's actions, Mia imitated him and roared as well. However, with Mia's body size, the sound she made was weaker than a common house pet's. 
Not here, Agatha commented. Remember, children, these are the lowest class of humans. You can eat them if you're hungry, but if it's treasure you desire, don't bother attacking them. They won't drop any gold coins. Where I'm about to bring you to is where the lord of these humans resides at. The lord is extremely wealthy, and he possesses a great wealth of treasures, hee <laughs> hee. Agatha spread her wings as she spoke. Whoosh, a strong wind blew over Max's head, and Agatha flew up once more. A lord, ha. Huh? Max followed his mother, and at the same time, he looked around for the lord that she had mentioned. Sure enough, this is a medieval world, and the existence of a city lord is to be expected. Max turned around and looked at the entire city. Their terror aside, most of the citizens looked emaciated, and their streets were dirty and dilapidated. The horses that were dragging goods had gone berserk, and as a result, most of their carriages had flipped over. This city looks a little poor. Max thought to himself. However, upon spotting the Lord, Max immediately understood why this was the case. Most of the income the city generated had been funneled into building up their military. At this moment, he had already reached the Lord's inner castle. The inner castle was the city within the city. It was surrounded by higher and thicker walls, and it was the Lord's living area. A large army was lined up neatly there, and everyone was riding on top of a horse. Dragon. A dragon is approaching. Run. Don't panic. We are soldiers, we have to fight until. Oh my god. There are three of them. Run. Oh great goddess of order, Eunomia. Please bless me in defeating these great evils. Naturally, the neat military formation that was formed just moments ago had collapsed the moment they saw the dragons. Many of them had fallen off their horses, as they shouted and scurried away. A few soldiers raised their weapons and pointed them at Max, trembling. However, once Max locked eyes with them, the soldiers immediately threw away their weapons and ran away. Some even hid under the horses' stomachs and cowered in fear. It reminded Max of hiding under a table during an earthquake. Do you see, my children? Before our might, the tin cans that these soldiers are wearing mean nothing. Agatha mocked the soldiers and roared once again. Roar. Chapter 33 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Specialists.translator Endless Fantasy Translation Editor Endless Fantasy Translation Mia roared as well. She seemed to like enjoy roaring very much, and she would clap her front paws from time to time. Naturally, Max roared as well, although the thought of scaring the human soldiers did not give him much sense of accomplishment. However, Max noticed that the horses that the soldiers were riding on did not seem to be frightened. Most of the horses were still standing in place. Every once in a while, they would even lock gazes with the dragons. Regardless, they had never lowered their heads, and they did not run away. Why aren't these horses afraid of us? With such a question in mind, Max turned his head and took a quick glance at his surroundings. Some distance away, Max found a training ground for horses. In there, Max noticed there were several dragons carved out of wood. They were placed in the spots where the horses ate. There were gongs and drums scattered on the ground, and their battered surface indicated that they were used regularly. Desensitization training. Max knew of this method. In ancient times, in order to prevent the horses from being timid in war, every warhorse was trained from a young age. One such training that the warhorses had undergone was desensitization training. The horses would be sent to attack scarecrow that were carrying knives, spears, or sticks. Only by doing so would the warhorses remain calm in the battlefield. Hmm, but it seems that the desensitization training for horses of this world is a little different. Under normal circumstances, the desensitization training for horses was targeted at the enemy humans. As for the horses in this city, however, they were trained to be desensitized towards dragons. In other words, the soldiers before them were specialists meant to deal with dragons. 
At this point, Max noticed a person walking out among the soldiers. That person was wearing a full set of Milan plate armor. His footsteps were steady, and as he walked forward, he lifted his helmet and looked up at them. The man was probably in his seventies. His beard was white but his physique remained strong. He looked like he had exercised a lot when he was young. That person knelt on one knee and with a sincere expression, he asked, Dear Lady Agatha, may I ask why you have brought two young masters? Or ladies here? Max frowned. This person seems to be educated. He must be this so dot called Lord. Moreover, this Lord is rather smart. Now that we dragons have invaded his inner castle, he's trying to bargain his way out. He knows that violence would lead him nowhere. Ardarian. You are still alive, huh? You're really tenacious, hee <laughs> hee. Agatha recognized the Lord, and thus, she called out the Lord's name immediately. This was the first time that Max had heard his mother speaking the human tongue. He did not expect his mother to know the tongue. It was rather surprising for Max. Ardarian looked calm on the surface. However, underneath his calm exterior, his hands behind his back were trembling uncontrollably. The relationship of humans and dragons were like mice and cats, both physically and mentally. However, Ardarian knew that if he were to flee the scene, he would be sprayed to death by Agatha's dragon dreath. He and Agatha were old acquaintances. They had met a few times before. Unlike some dragons, Agatha had a gentle temperament. Like all dragons, however, Agatha also liked treasures. As a result of these two characteristics, whenever Ardarian had been woken up from his slumber by her dragon roar, he would hand Agatha his treasures to make her leave. To Ardarian, Agatha's behavior was more akin to a bandit's. However, unlike normal bandits, Agatha could not be eliminated nor defeated easily. Ardarian recalled the last time he handed Agatha his treasure, it should have been last year. Agatha most likely isn't here for treasure this time. Regarding this matter, Ardarian had always kept a secret stash of treasure ready in his room, all so he could satisfy the dragon during any of her sudden visits. However, the difference this time was that Agatha had two dragon hatchlings with her. This is probably a demonstration. She's probably telling me that these are her children, and she's warning me not to think of funny ideas in the future. Lady Agatha, I have prepared some gifts for you. Ardarian shot a glance to his attendant. A moment later, a chest of treasure was hurriedly brought to the scene. I approve of your straightforwardness, Ardarian. With that, Agatha flicked her claws and opened the chest. It was filled with shiny gold coins and colorful jewelry. A ceremonial sword made of pure gold was inserted in the chest, and there was a jewelry necklace hanging on it. Max watched from the side. He understood all the messages that his mother had taught him to this point. There was no need to kill all the humans. It was best to keep them alive. The village would serve as a source of camel meat. On the other hand, the city would serve as a source of treasure. However, being the proud dragon she was, Agatha did not say those words aloud. Nevertheless, Max still understood. Before I leave, I have another question, Agatha stated. Longsong Alley doesn't usually have troops stationed here. For what purpose are you gathering troops now? Gulp, Aldarian gulped audibly. Sure enough, Agatha had caught on to this matter. Naturally, the troops were meant to serve as a means to deal with Agatha. However, in this moment, he could not tell Agatha up front that he had gathered these troops to deal with her, right? Therefore, Ardarian took a deep breath and replied. Lady Agatha, this army is used to deal with mountain bandits. For your information, if the mountain bandits are too rampant, I will not be able to gather enough treasures for you. To deal with bandits. Ha ha ha. Agatha's laughter echoed throughout the city. Then, Agatha faced Max, Max, my child, what do you think? Facing his mother's vertical pupils, Max exhaled. He knew that his mother was testing him. He's lying. Max spoke fluent human language and answered, 
these warhorses won't run when they see us. They are specially trained to be used against dragons. The air froze for a few seconds. Cold sweat broke out on Aldarian's head, and his heart thumped faster and faster. He did not even have the time to realize that the dragon hatchling speaking the human tongue. His most pressing concern at that moment was that his lie had been completely exposed. These warhorses are exactly as what the dragon hatchling has mentioned. They've undergone desensitization training since young, and they've been trained to face a dragon without any fright. They were meant to be used by a group of specialist infantrymen. They were meant to be used against you dragons. Chapter 34 You are listening at NovelFull.audio The consequences of slandering a dragon are severe. Translator Endless Fantasy Translation Editor Endless Fantasy Translation How Audacious Hee <laughs> hee Agatha was not shocked. After all, she knew the truth about this army from the very beginning. She had only asked Max to teach her child a lesson. Agatha continued, Lord Ardarian, you must have spent a fortune to raise this army, right? I won't kill you. It's not like I'll get any benefit from killing you anyway. Get your soldiers off their horses. I want all of them for myself. As soon as Agatha finished speaking, the soldiers who were still sitting on the horses quickly got off their horses and ran for their lives. Boom, a huge dragon breath was spat out from Agatha's mouth, and the strong light drowned everything. Even Max could not help but close his eyes. As expected, the ancient dragon's power was so strong that it had taken only mere milliseconds for her to fire such an intense dragon breath. Once the dragon's breath ended, only a pile of charcoal remained on the ground. Had Max not seen the horses with his very eyes, he would not have recognized the charred creatures before him. Lightning was still flowing from the corner of Agatha's mouth as she licked her lips and retracted her breath. Then she said, Ardarian, why did you do such a stupid thing? The money you've used to build this army is enough to exchange for a few years of peace. Even since ancient times, all armies were founded from real gold and silver. If soldiers were to participate in labor whilst serving, the costs of maintaining the army would be reduced. However, in doing so, the combat prowess of the army would also decline. On the other hand, if an army was built completely on the funds of the Lord, it would cost an exorbitant amount to maintain them. Moreover, compared to the residents living in the city, most of the soldiers present looked extremely well. Nourished. The weapons in their hands were clearly of high workmanship, and each of them were equipped with a nice set of armor. As for the horses that had just died, they were also special horses that had undergone training since they were young. The building of this army had undoubtedly racked up astronomical costs. Should the money be used as a tribute to Agatha, it could indeed be exchanged for a long period of peace. Max had the same question as his mother, and thus, he turned his gaze to Lord Ardarian as well. Yes. Ardarian paused for a long time before answering, there are three heroes in the kingdom. They are Tahir, Carvela, and Rafik. You killed them, so I want to avenge them. I built this army for this very reason. Hearing such an answer, Agatha snorted. What rubbish, I don't know any of these people. I told you I'm a reasonable dragon, killing people won't bring me any benefits. The last time I killed someone was a few years ago. Ardarian suddenly raised his head and widened his eyes. You didn't kill them. Agatha spread her wings and raised her head to roar. Do you actually think that I, a proud dragon will lie to you? Max dared not speak. He did not know who Carvela and Rafik were. However, he was very familiar with the name Tahir. He was one of the three adventurers that he had killed in the Battle of Existence. In that case, Rafik was the swordsman, and Carvela was the female archer. They seem to be renowned individuals in this world. I'm the one who killed these three people, but the humans thought that it was Agatha had done the deed. Max nodded. This is to my benefit. At least throughout his period as a dragon hatchling, he did not want to make too many enemies for himself. 
life was already hard enough as it was. However, as Agatha had been slandered, she was extremely angry. The periosteum on her opened wings trembled slightly, and lightning coursed through her entire body. Idiot! Idiot! Don't pin all the bad things that happened to you on me. Tell me, why do you think I did it? Ardarian quickly knelt on the ground. Lady Agatha, please calm down. The main reason is. The main reason is that the three of them are extremely powerful humans. The day they formed a party, they were instantly bestowed the title of, the three heroes. But ever since they passed through the desert, all news of them had disappeared. After some investigation, it was determined that they had died. Aside from you, I really can't think of any other creature that is strong enough to defeat them. You must know, Agatha, you are the strongest creature within the northern region of the kingdom. After hearing these words, Max nodded. That's right. I would come to the same conclusion if I were in his shoes. If anything were to be blamed, they could only blame the bad luck of the three individuals. Underestimating their enemy was one issue, but encountering me was their greatest misfortune. After all, no one would have expected a dragon hatchling to be capable of killing three of the kingdom's strongest individuals. TCH, Agatha let out a dissatisfied breath. Human, you must pay the price for slandering a dragon. I admit my mistake, Ardarian replied. I will prepare the treasure to apologize. Agatha suddenly jumped down from the city wall and stared at the soldiers with great interest. No, this time, I don't want the treasure. Get your soldiers to line up. Group up based on your hometowns. After saying that, Agatha smiled. Accept the inspection of a dragon. Generally speaking, conscription was done according on one's hometown. Prior to conscription, the soldiers might have been friends, relatives, or even lovers. As such, in order to prevent the soldiers from forming a clique among themselves, the superiors would deliberately mess up their order and surround each soldier with strangers. Dot however, Agatha had ordered the soldiers to group up based on their hometowns. Those from the same hometown were standing together. Max did not understand the purpose of his mother's action. Similarly, the lord and his soldiers who were nervously lining up did not understand the purpose of the dragon's order as well. However, since it was an order from Agatha, no one dared to resist. Agatha's cruelty was completely imprinted in everyone's heart. With just one breath, she had wiped out all of the warhorses in an instant. If Agatha was unhappy, she could blow them away with just a single breath. No one would be able to escape death. In a short while, the soldiers had all lined up. Report. Report to Lady Agatha. We have already gathered an order according to our hometown. Please give us your orders. The soldiers said with a trembling voice. Very good. Agatha replied, Now, report the names of your villages one by one. Chapter 35 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Max's Debut Translator Endless Fantasy Translation Editor Endless Fantasy Translation Mindon Fort Ambition Barrack One by one, the small groups reported their origins. Max whispered their hometown's names together with them. His understanding of this world was still too little. As such, this was a very good opportunity for him to learn more about the world. At the very least, he would not get lost once his mother left him. Dear Heart Village It was not until the soldiers reported the name of this particular village. That Agatha slowly opened her eyes. Dear Heart Village was where Agatha had brought Max to earlier. It was also a village that Agatha had kept in captivity. Its main purpose was to provide Agatha with an endless supply of camel meat to eat. They had a rather strange relationship. Under normal circumstances, Agatha would not kill the people in this village, but she would also not allow them to flee from her captivity. As long as Dear Heart Village continued to provide her with camels, Agatha would not make trouble for them. However, there were exceptions to her behavior. For example, 
in order to demonstrate the hierarchy of their relationship, Agatha had ordered his son to kill one of the villagers to make an example of them. Agatha stretched out her claws and pointed at the soldiers of Deer Heart Village. You can leave now. After being momentarily stunned, the soldiers from Deer Heart Village then fled in panic. Continue reporting. Agatha said. Fort Silver Blade. Saran City. Marion City. Fort Dragon Claw. Agatha opened her eyes again. Stop, repeat what you just said. What's the name of your village? Fort Dragon Claw. Lady Agatha, this is our village. Before that person finished speaking, a dragon breath was unleashed. In an instant, the group of people that belonged to Fort Dragon Claw had been murdered by Agatha. Fort Dragon Claw, huh? Hee <laughs> hee, I know that place. Someone chopped off my mother's claws there. I don't have any feelings for my mother, but I will kill everyone from that village. Agatha was indeed a reasonable dragon. She made sure to explain her reasons for murdering the soldiers from Fort Dragon Claw. Once everyone had reported the place of their origin, the scene fell into silence. Max noticed Agatha's gaze falling on him. Max, you said that you wanted to prove that you have no compassion towards humans. Max nodded. Yes, mother. Then I'll leave these people to you. Max flew to the sky above the inner castle. A group of shivering humans who dared not escape huddled together, and they were looking at him in panic. According to mother, these people are now mine to deal with. Naturally, Max knew what his mother meant. In Deer Heart Village, Max had let go of a baby girl. Max thought that it was worth it because the baby girl had good aptitude for magic and he believed that he could use her for his own purposes in the future. However, at the same time, his actions had aroused the suspicion of his mother. As such, Max needed to torture the humans below to prove to his mother that he was a normal dragon. However, this was only part of the reason for torturing them. At the same time, it would also serve to demonstrate his strength to the humans. After all, Agatha would leave him and Mia one day. Once she left, the two young dragons would be targeted by the humans. As such, before such a situation could arise, Max needed to beat the humans into submission. He needed to make them tremble whenever they heard the word dragon. He needed to make it so that even when they were facing dragon hatchlings, they would steer away from them. Dot lastly, he also needed to make sure that he did not kill everyone. After all, they were the last of the poor lord's possessions. In order to obtain more treasures from the lord, he needed to keep his subordinates alive. Based on these considerations, Max thought long and hard about what he should do next. You lowly humans. You slandered my mother and blamed the dragon race for crimes that we have not committed. So, you shall pay the price. But I, Max Agatha Hill Alexander, have also inherited my mother's kindness. So, only half of the people here will be killed. You are now arranged into small groups according to your hometowns. In that case, half of each group will live, and half of you will die. I'll leave all of you to choose the sacrifices among yourselves. You have one minute. Let's begin. Once Max finished his last sentence, the crowd below became lively. A cacophony of people counting, arguing, and crying could be heard. After a minute had passed, each group was further separated into subgroups. Those who would live stood in the distance. Those who were left in the middle were those who were willing to sacrifice themselves. Max took a look. Those who had voluntarily sacrificed themselves were most likely old people, fathers, older brothers, and so on. Max had expected this outcome. At the same time, it was also the last shred of mercy Max had given them. Thunder elementals, heed my call. Transform into arrows and pierce through their chests. Max was chanting the incantation for Lightning Arrow, the most basic thunder magic for red dragons. It collected the lightning elementals in the air, forged them into the shape of an arrow, and fired them forward to deal massive damage. BZZT, following his first shot, 
a person fell to the ground with a muffled sound and his body was paralyzed. BZZT, BZZT, lightning arrows fell from the sky one after another, and the people below lowered their heads and accepted their fate. This was the difference between humans and dragons. Generally speaking, a human needed to study for a few years before they could use a spell like lightning arrow. Moreover, lightning arrow was the most basic type of thunder magic. Even the brightest among humans needed a year to master the spell, and some pitiful ones were incapable of learning it, even if they were to devote their entire lives studying it. Meanwhile, red dragons were capable of casting the spell since birth. You are hiding your strength. Max suddenly heard Agatha's cold voice behind him. Max did not expect his mother to see through him. In fact, ever since he had used the battle of existence to kill Tahir. Max's magical aptitude had improved by leaps and bounds. In fact, in terms of thunder magic, Max felt that he was comparable to his own mother, who was an ancient dragon. While his spells might not be as powerful, in terms of the number of spells he knew, Max was capable of beating most red dragons at this point. However, he did not want to show his true strength. After all, acting like an alien was not welcomed by the red dragons. But now that mother has seen through me. I have no reason to hold back. As you wish, mother, Max replied. I'll use my full strength. Thunder elementals, heed my call. Transform into arrows and cover the sky. Lightning arrow rain. Chapter 36 You are listening at novelfull.audio. But that's clearly a dragon hatchling. Translator. Endless Fantasy Translation Editor Endless Fantasy Translation The ancient and obscure dragon tongue resounded in the sky above the inner castle. This language was difficult to pronounce and difficult to understand. It was not designed to allow dragons to communicate with each other. Dragons were mostly arrogant and they prided themselves in operating alone. There were very few situations where they would have a need to communicate with other dragons. Most of the time, the dragon tongue was used to facilitate the recitation of magic. The dragon tongue was concise and straight to the point, and thus, it was the best language for reciting spells. Therefore, the incantations that had taken Tahir several proses to finish chanting, would only take Max a few seconds to finish. Moreover, no humans would be able to understood Max's chants. The obscure dragon tongue itself was already so profound that it would leave deep impressions on humans, not to mention that the tongue could not be spoken with the same pronunciation from the thin human throats. As for a text-based version of the dragon language, it had never been discovered or been researched before. Dragons possessed the ability to inherit memories. As such, they did not need books to impart knowledge. Even since birth, they had already possessed the knowledge of several generations of dragons. Moreover, every time they slept, their strength would also increase. At this moment, to the humans below, the sounds that were coming off of Max's mouth were like the chimes of a bell. As he watched his soldiers get pierced through the heart by lightning one after another. Ardarian clenched his hands tightly, but he sighed helplessly. He had no other choice but to follow the whims of the dragon hatchling. He had originally decided that no matter what happened, he would not escape. He would bear witness to the whole ordeal with his own two eyes. This was partly to understand the attacks of the dragon hatchling. The spell that the dragon hatchling used was the same as what was written in the textbook for fighting against dragons. The only magic that ordinary red dragon hatchlings could use was the lightning arrow of the thunder element. It was said that it was one of the simpler spells of thunder magic. Nevertheless, it was still a high wall to overcome for many humans who yearned for magic. The root cause of this phenomenon was that magic did not originate from humans, but rather, humans had learned it from other creatures. Only by learning the language of the elves could one have the opportunity to use the magic of the elves. As for the language of the dragons, humans have made little to no progress on that end. However, after the first few shots, Ardarian noticed Agatha saying something to the dragon hatchling. Following this, the dragon hatchling rose to a higher position. 
Then, an even faster and stranger incantation was read out from the dragon hatchling's mouth. What? Is that? Dark clouds gathered in the sky. The rolling dark clouds were like a huge windmill that constantly rotated. At the same time, all sunlight was blocked from entering Long Song Alley, and it felt as if night had descended over the city. Although Ardarian had never studied magic, he understood its principles somewhat. The dark clouds meant that there was a storm approaching, and the clouds were filled with an almost endless amount of thunder and water elementals. In other words, the young dragon was brewing something. A disaster. Level magic would soon befall them. Lightning arrow rain. Max stated the final words in the dragon tongue. The moment his chant ended, thunder elementals rapidly descended from the sky and came to Max's side. They intertwined and formed the shape of a chrysalis. Then, they rotated and contracted, turning into a thin and long arrow. Like shape. One lightning arrow was enough to illuminate half of Max's body. As such, the thousands of lightning arrows that lit up Long Song Alley had illuminated the dark clouds, making them look like soft, fluffy cotton balls. In contrast to the picturesque scene in the air, the scene below was like hell. Even Max did not expect the power of the lightning arrow rain to be so great. It was the same lightning arrow rain that Tahir had cast. However, by using the dragon tongue to cast the spell, its effects were amplified. Although Max had promised his mother that he would not hold back. He had never expected the change in languages to affect the power of the spell this much. At this point, there was no way to explain it to his mother. Max waved his claws. Instantly, thousands of lightning arrows shot down. The boom of thunder surrounded Max. He was momentarily deafened, and he could not hear anything. It was as if he was isolated from the world. Upon looking back, he noticed that Agatha was watching the scene with great interest. A hint of surprise flashed in her widened eyes. Pure red dragons were not afraid of thunder. Even under the deafening boom of thunder, true red dragons would treat the explosion as if it were some kind of sweet melody. As such, Mia was very happy. She clapped her hands and flew back and forth among the lightning arrows, and at times, she would even let the arrows hit her. She was like a naughty child that ran about in the rain on purpose. Boom, boom, whenever each lightning arrow made contact with the ground, huge explosions would ensue. In fact, after the first bolt fell, all the soldiers who had volunteered to die below had died. The subsequent arrows that struck them had merely deformed them until they were beyond recognition. Pieces or strips of charred coal danced in the air, and the amount of soot that was generated was immense. By the time the rain of arrows had stopped, a large semi. Circular crater had already appeared on the ground. There was nothing in the pit. The soldiers, along with the charred remains of the warhorses lying on the ground, had all been vaporized by the high temperature brought by the lightning arrows. The soldiers who were watching from afar had also suffered many accidental injuries. Smoke, charred flesh, and pain sobs. Once all of it had dissipated. Max spread his wings and said, This is your punishment. Ardarian's legs went weak, and he almost fell to the ground. This is lightning arrow rain. It's one of the most advanced thunder spells. Only a few humans in history have managed to cast it. Tahir once performed this spell and defeated the enemy's vanguard. Is this an adult dragon? No, it's merely a hatchling. How can it cast such a spell? Ardarian finally understood. Dot Agatha need not do anything. Agatha's child alone was already strong enough to annihilate everyone present. Thank you. Lord Dragon Hatchling. For punishing us. Ardarian took the lead and bowed to Max. He knew that he could not, he must not mount any resistance. Otherwise, with Long Song Alley's current military might, they would be wiped off the map by the dragon hatchling. Moreover, the soldiers who were lucky enough to survive were already scared out of their wits. They quickly imitated Ardarian and knelt down towards Max. 
Chapter 37 You are listening at NovelFull.audio The Kinship Between Dragons Translator Endless Fantasy Translation Editor Endless Fantasy Translation, Lord Dragon Hatchling, I do not currently possess any more treasures. Ardarian said to Max, but I am willing to give you my sword as a gift. Ardarian had dealt with dragons many times, and thus, he had some understanding of the temper of dragons, especially the temper of red dragons. Slaughtering humans brought no pleasure to red dragons, and thus, they would not kill without reason. Even if they were to kill, they would most likely not obtain a satisfactory amount of treasure. Dot therefore, Ardarian was certain that the dragon hatchling had not been satisfied by the death of his soldiers. However, as he had already handed his treasures to Agatha moments ago, he had nothing left to offer the dragon hatchling. All he could think of was the long sword hanging on his waist. Upon this thought, he took out the long sword at his waist and handed it over with both hands. Max glanced at it. In truth, Max felt that he had already done enough. There was no need to further aggravate the situation. Max had already massacred more than 500 humans and gained his mother's approval. His destructive and powerful spell had already served as a demonstration of his power to the humans. In the future, even if Agatha were to leave them, no one would dare to disturb him or Mia. Moreover, in the ethics of dragons, it was inappropriate to collect wealth before their parents. Even if he were to accept the longsword, he would still need to hand it over to his mother in the end. Therefore, Max shook his head. I have no need of treasures. I'm merely giving you a lesson. As long as you remember this day forever, it will be enough. Never forget what you have experienced today. Ardarian heaved a sigh of relief. The sword was the sword of the commander of Longsong Alley. Had it not been for the fact that he had run out of treasures, Ardarian would never have offered it as a tribute to the dragons. After all, if he were to do so, it would deal a devastating blow to his reputation once outsiders learned of it. Handing over the sword of the commander was equivalent to giving up the authority of Longsong Alley. It was an extremely desperate move. Fortunately, the dragon hatchling had declined his offer. Roar, Agatha let out another roar as if she was very satisfied with the situation. Remember. This is the consequence of slandering a dragon. After giving her last warning, she spread her wings and left with her children. While he was in the air, Max turned back to take a look at the city. Although they were already high up in the air, the crater that he had created with his magic could still be seen clearly. The power of dragons had far surpassed his expectations. Aside from that, Max also realized something important while he was slaughtering the soldiers. He did not seem to have any guilt. Logically speaking, although he had become a red dragon, his heart had used and soul was still meant to be that of a human's. However, even after killing so many humans in one go, Max did not feel uncomfortable at all. Perhaps I've finally become a dragon, both physically and mentally. In truth, much of a human's emotions were affected by the physiology of their bodies. The secretion of hormones would directly affect the mood and even the thoughts of a person. Females would feel inexplicable anxiety during their menstrual period, pregnant women would become more prone to hunger, and those who regularly stayed up late would be more prone to depression. These were all examples of the effects of hormones on the human body. Max suspected that if were to continue living as a dragon, it would not be long before he would become like Mia, unsympathetic towards humans. He might even be in the mood to play around while humans were dying all around him. Max heaved a mental sigh. Back in the desert, in Agatha's underground lair. Explain yourself, Max. Why do you know that spell? The first thing Agatha did upon returning to the lair was to ask Max about the lightning arrow rain spell that he had cast. Max had already thought of a plan along the way home. He would take advantage of the pride of the dragons by praising Agatha, and once he had lowered her guard, she would accept his excuses more easily. That's because as your child, I inherited a small part of your strength. One morning some time ago, I felt as if my body was connected to the memories of our predecessors, and I suddenly learned of this spell. 
there was no loophole in Max's explanation. A pure dragon was born with the memories of their ancestors, after all. During the growth of a dragon hatchling, these memories would slowly become clearer, and their magical abilities would gradually awaken. Ha, huh, well done, Max. I have to admit that your performance today has amazed me. Agatha praised him, her tone more gentle than ever. Thank you for the compliment, mother. I will work harder in the future. Max nodded and thanked her. Naturally, Max knew how hard it was to get praise from a dragon, especially when that dragon was his mother. Through his mother's gentle tone, Max knew that his mother had well and truly acknowledged his magical aptitude this time. Of course you need to work harder. You need to grow up, learn more spells. Agatha started off slowly, but halfway through her speech, she suddenly changed topics. After all, both of you have to leave my side now. What? Although Max had expected his mother to abandon him and Mia one day, he did not expect that day to come so soon. Generally speaking, mother dragons would raise their dragon hatchlings until they had become teen dragons before leaving them. Max and Mia were only dragon hatchlings at this moment. Because both of you are now qualified to live independently. Agatha explained with a wry smile. You killed those three heroes, didn't you, Max? Max replied, it wasn't me. He would not admit it even if he was beaten to death. Although he did not know how his mother had guessed it, he refused to admit it. Otherwise, should his mother learn of Tahir's strength in the future, she would definitely suspect how a dragon hatchling such as himself had managed to beat such a powerful foe. If Agatha were to learn of Max's battle of existence, the consequences might be disastrous. Perhaps, she would even kill him on the spot. Never doubt the kinship between dragons, and never doubt the red dragon's rejection of aliens. Those who were capable of using the battle of existence were considered aliens as well. Agatha suddenly stretched her entire head over and pressed it against the tip of Max's nose. Although he was Agatha's child, it was the first time Max had such close contact with his mother. Chapter 38 You are listening at NovelFull.audio Strength Through Adversity Translator Endless Fantasy Translation Editor Endless Fantasy Translation The pair of lava-dot-like eyes were staring at him, her sharp fangs clearly visible. After a moment of silence, Agatha stood up, Hee hee, I see that you're not a liar. Phew. Max heaved a sigh of relief once he saw that his mother no longer doubted him. Their parting was so sudden. Agatha, who had been by their side just moments ago, was now packing up her treasures. Agatha had many treasures, piled up to the size of Agatha herself. It was not an easy task to pack them all up. This was the first time Max had seen his mother being so diligent. She shuttled back and forth between her treasure piles, and sorted her treasures neatly. Max walked up and helped to pack up as they were still family. However, he was pushed aside by Agatha's fierce gaze. Sure enough, dragons would never allow others to touch their treasures, not even their own children. By the standards of dragons, losing a child was of little consequence, as they could give birth to new ones. If they were to die, then they would be free from all worldly desires, and they would no longer experience any pain. However, once their treasures were gone, then they would be well and truly gone. Mom. In the silence, Mia suddenly burst into tears. This was not the first time Mia had cried. As a giant dragon, this was a very abnormal phenomenon. Mom. I don't understand, Mia said. Did we do something wrong? No, then why are you abandoning us? I did is our family. Not good enough. This was not an issue for Max. After all, they were dragons. Since they were dragons, they had to act according to the moral standards of dragons. For other creatures, love and affection were a means of survival. In a group of animals, those who ignored their young would result in their young being killed by their predators. However, those who had feelings and were soft-hearted towards their young would protect them. 
those that had survived would inherit the behavior of their parents, and thus, they would protect their young as well. Just like breathing and eating, emotions were not just a physiological phenomenon, they were a necessity for the continuation of the species. Dragons, on the other hand, did not need emotions. After all, dragons were at the top of the food chain. Even if a dragon hatchling were to be abandoned at a young age, they would still be able to survive. Therefore, dragons rarely had deep kinship. This was something that Max had realized ever since becoming a dragon. Perhaps it was the price for being strong. Those who excelled in something would usually display different behavior from those who were average. Humans liked treasures because treasures meant stability, freedom, and comfort. Dot, however, for dragons, it was clear that collecting dragons would give no merit to them. After all, the concept of living expenses did not apply to dragons. Nevertheless, almost all dragons still adored treasures. Agatha was obviously impatient. She stood up and spread her wings as if she was threatening her children. Enough. Shut up. I should never have given birth to both of you oddballs in the first place. I've been here for far too long to raise the both of you. I need to move. And the only possessions I'll bring with me are my lovely treasures, not you two. How will you live in the future? This is something both of you have to figure out by yourselves. With that, Agatha suddenly twisted her body and swept her thick tail at Mia, slamming her heavily against the wall. Since when did great red dragons require someone to look over us? I, Agatha Alexia Galanstrosi, have struggled to survive ever since I was a child. Forget my parents, I don't even have any brothers or sisters. They're all dead. Only the ones who survive in adversity are worthy of being a dragon. This is the test that is given to us by the dragon god, Tiamat. Do you understand? If you understand, then rest well. Tomorrow. I will set off tomorrow. If you can make a name for yourself in the future, perhaps we will meet again one day. Or perhaps, I'll spot your body parts in a human auction one day. Hee <laughs> hee. Following her lecture, Agatha returned to her pile of treasures and laid down. The pain from her mother's tail sweep and her harsh words had silenced Mia's cries. She buried her head and covered her whole body with her wings. Sigh. There was nothing Max could do in regards to the domestic violence that had just occurred. He had no intention of challenging his mother's patience in that moment. The most he could do was to reach out his claws to pat Mia's head. Don't cry, don't cry. Mother might leave you, but I won't. Max comforted her casually and wrapped his wings tightly around Mia's body. Nevertheless, no matter how he tried to comfort his sister, it was to no avail. Mia continued to cry. How did things turn out this way? I'm a human, but I'm acting more like a dragon. This crybaby Mia is acting more like a normal human. This thought flashed through Max's mind. However, he quickly dismissed it. When Mia ate humans, she did not hesitate. She even thought that it was fun to kill humans. She was merely unusual in the sense that she depended heavily on her family. She was just as unusual as her brother, Max. Early the next morning. Max was woken up by a gust of wind. Agatha had already spread her wings, packed up her treasures, and flew away. Pulling out his wings from under Mia's head, Max walked around the cave. Hmm, not bad. The originally crowded cave immediately became spacious. I can make a sofa here. Let me think. I can grab a few sheep and shave their fur. It's not good for my body to sleep on rocks all the time. Eh. I might as well open a bathtub there. There's a drought of water in the desert, and I haven't taken a bath since I was born. Now that mother is gone, I can do whatever I want. But where should I obtain the water from? I might as well borrow some from Long Song Alley. But I definitely transport the water here by myself. This wouldn't fit my image of a dragon. Damn it, I should have convinced mother to leave some of the horses alive. 
While Max was thinking about how he should renovate the lair, he suddenly stepped on something. It was a bulging sack the size of a basketball. Max opened the sack. Shiny gold coins flowed out. This. Max weighed the pile of gold coins in his hand. There were more than a thousand of them. Chapter 39 You are listening at NovelFull.audio I'll use my full strength. Translator Endless Fantasy Translation Editor Endless Fantasy Translation as for the source of the bag of gold coins. Without needing a second thought, Max was immediately certain that it was Agatha's treasure. Did Mother forget? Max wondered aloud. However, upon recalling her meticulous behavior from the previous day, he doubted that Agatha had forgotten about her bag of gold coins. The only explanation was that she had intentionally left the bag behind. In a sense, it could be considered as the start.up funds for the two dragon hatchlings. How heavy! Max sighed. The gold coins were probably made of pure gold, and each of them had a satisfying weight in one's hand. In the human kingdom, the amount of money that Agatha had left them was probably enough for three generations to live in peace. However, for dragon hatchlings, it was just the right amount for them to lie on top of it, or for them to use as blankets. While looking in the direction in which Agatha had left, Max sighed heavily. Although she had said some rather harsh words, she had still secretly left behind a minor fortune for her children. The desert was still empty and yellow. However, if one looked carefully, one could see a few fat camels wandering in the desert without any defenses. Dot, they must be the tribute that Dear Heart Village had sent out. Mia, it's time to get up. As Max spoke, he picked up the sack and poured all the gold coins onto Mia. There was a loud crash. Mia shook her head and opened her eyes. Upon noticing the gold coins surrounding her body, Mia's eyes lit up. Mia, are you feeling better? Max felt that Mia would like these treasures. After all, glittering gold coins were a staple favorite of dragons. Ha, ha. This was the first time Mia had ever touched a gold coin with her own hands. Thus, she wagged her tail happily at the sight of the treasures. Like a child playing in water, she constantly threw the gold coins up in the air and allowed them to hit her body. Max doted on Mia as well. He helped pick up the gold coins and threw it at Mia's body. After her moment of joy, Mia suddenly looked around. Mother. Mother, are you there? No one answered. Mia lowered her head again and kicked away the gold coins beside her. TSK, so hard to please. Max complained in his heart. However, based on his experience of coaxing children in his previous life, at this time, all he needed was prepare her a delicious meal and she would instantly feel better, just like magic. Do you have anything you want to eat? Max asked. I have no appetite. Camel. This time, I won't snatch it from you. I'll even give you its thigh. How about it? Mia did not answer. Instead, she wrapped herself up with her wings. She looked like a dragon dumpling. Oh, right. Max suddenly remembered something. Have you ever eaten roasted meat made with spices? Max suddenly realized that although Red Dragon was the only dragon race that liked to eat cooked food, that was only true when the raw meat was roasted. As for things like pepper and spices, Red Dragons had never tried them. After all, it was already good enough for a dragon to know how to cook well. Why would they care so much about cooking? Most of the dragons thought that if they had the time to study cooking, it would be better to go out and snatch more treasure. Therefore, Max dared to bet that even in Mia's inherited memories, she had never enjoyed roasted meat that was meticulously cooked. Spices. What's that? Mia was silent for a moment before she asked. Max chuckled. As expected, Mia has never heard of such a thing. As an independent young man, Max had learned to cook since kindergarten. The problem now, however, is where I should get these spices from. Dragons. 
Indeed, they are not the type of creature to lie. Ardarian put his hands on his forehead and buried his head on the table. He had already repeated the day's events dozens of times in his mind. Agatha's words constantly replayed in his mind. Considering that dragons were a very proud race, even if some dragons would use conspiracies and tricks. However, most of the tricks they played were used to deal with other dragons. Dragons very rarely lied to the weak humans. According to Agatha, Agatha did not kill the three heroes. Someone else had killed the three heroes. However, Ardarian still could not figure out just what kind of powerful existence in the northern region had managed to kill Tahir. Could it be that dragon hatchling? A possibility suddenly came to his mind. It was the dragon hatchling that could use lightning arrow rain. Could it be that young dragon that killed Tahir? However, this thought was quickly rejected by Ardarian. Yes, that young dragon was indeed very powerful. It had casually used a spell that humans could not even grasp. But today, that young dragon had also mentioned something. I'll use my full strength. This was what the young dragon had said to Agatha. The dragon is still young. There's no way that it's capable of telling lies. Moreover, no child dragon would dare to lie to their mother. Therefore, what the young dragon stated at that time should be the truth. In other words, the dragon hatchling had used its full strength to unleash the lightning arrow rain earlier. I doubt that level of strength is enough to defeat Tahir, who excelled in thunder magic. The dragon hatchling does not seem to be the culprit. Then who else could it be? Knock knock knock. There was a knock on the door. My liege, we found Carvella's body. What? Ardarian quickly got up and walked out of the room. Not a single day had passed where he did not send out scouts to look for the remains of the three heroes. However, no matter how hard they tried, they could not find the remains of the three heroes. The last people who saw the three heroes were the villagers from Deer Heart Village. However, they did not gain any useful information there. The villagers said the same thing. They said that they had seen three strangers passing by the village from afar, and they did not have any interaction with the village. Nevertheless, they had finally found Carvella's body. Ardarian walked into to a room. A chunk of charcoal was laid across a table. The charcoal had vaguely made out a human shape. Had it not been for the tag on her body, no one would have recognized it as Carvella. As it had been left in the desert for a long time, Carvella's corpse was covered in a layer of yellow sand. In order to protect the integrity of the corpse, of course, it could not be washed with water. Someone wet his fingers and flicked the sand out one grain at a time. Warrior Carvella. Ardarian immediately crumpled onto the ground and cried. Chapter 40 You are listening at NovelFull.audio War. War is coming. Translator. Endless Fantasy Translation Editor Endless Fantasy Translation After holding a simple funeral for Carvella Ardarian returned to his room, dipped a quill and moistened his tongue. Then he began to write a letter. Honorable King Agatha invaded and caused a lot of damage to Longsong Alley. Among our losses include 1,200 warhorses and 621 soldiers. Oh, of course. I don't mean to complain to you, but I'm merely reporting our situation here. I apologize for not protecting Longsong Alley well. Although we've suffered a great loss, we did not gain nothing from this ordeal. Through Agatha's words, I've learned that someone else has killed the three heroes. As for who the murderer is, that remains to be seen. But I suspect that it might be another red dragon, or perhaps a blue dragon. Today, my subordinates located the corpse of the hero, Carvella, in the desert. If you were at the scene, I believe that you will share my sorrow. As for the process of the autopsy, let's just say that it was gruesome. In short, Carvella died from the high temperature. She was probably killed by thunder or fire magic. The only one capable of defeating the three heroes in the northern region should be a dragon. Therefore, 
I speculate that there might be another dangerous dragon living in the Northern Territory who is not Agatha. Its threat is no less than that of Agatha's. I hope that the kingdom will provide us support to eliminate the threat as soon as possible. P.S. Carvella has been buried under the ridge to the south of Longsong Alley. Stand at the northern gate of the kingdom's capital and look towards the direction of Mount Kamalung. That is the direction of Carvella's final resting place. If I am lucky enough to find the remains of the other two heroes, I will bury them together. I hope that your highness can pass on this news so that the future generations can remember them. Yours truly, the loyal but incompetent, Ardarian. By the time he finished writing the letter, it was already late at night. Ardarian ordered his men to bring three horses and deliver the letter to the capital overnight. As a lord, he was well dot versed in writing. However, the scenes from earlier that day was still vivid in his mind. His hand, which was holding the pen, was constantly trembling as he wrote the letter. He looked out of the window at the night sky that was as dark as the abyss. Ardarian dared not even imagine what that unknown dragon looked like. Logically speaking, his Long Song Alley was not a wealthy city. It could at most satisfy the appetite of a single dragon when it came to treasures. If there two of them, Long Song Alley would not be able to afford such a huge expenditure. There was also another problem. Dragons were not a united race. As a result of the other dragon's existence, both dragons would most likely extort him for treasures at an even greater pace. The two dragons would not company exist in peace. Unfortunately, to Ardarian's knowledge, all signs indicated that there was another dangerous dragon living in the desert. Perhaps it was even stronger than Agatha. If such a dangerous dragon was not eradicated as soon as possible, it would pose a huge danger for the Ponde kingdom in the future. Back when the humans were still divided and the continent was split into five countries, each nation had suffered great losses to the dragons. However, now that they had united under a single flag, they could gather the strength of the entire country and sweep the north together. It was also a great opportunity to get rid of the mystery dragon and Agatha. Moreover, the matter was also getting more and more urgent. All three heroes had already perished, and it was enough to show the urgency of the situation. Ardarian clenched his fists. If it was just Agatha alone, Long Song Alley would have been able to hold on for a while, but now there were two dragons, and one of them had killed all three heroes that the kingdom was proud of. That they needed to get rid of the mystery dragon as soon as possible. Daddy, Daddy. Ha ha ha. Daddy, you're running too slow. You won't be able to catch me like this. The little princess, Tess was not even ten years old. Her body was very thin, but she ran like a deer. Slow down. Slow down. The old king had already retired from the battlefield for many years, and he was no longer as brave as he was in the past. Moreover, some of the internal injuries he had suffered on the battlefield had all come knocking at his door at his old age. Once he started running, he felt as if his knees and lumbar joints were on fire. He could not catch little Tess at all, and thus, he needed to think of a way to end the game of cat and mouse as soon as possible. Hey! The old king squatted on the ground and panted. Little Tess, let's. Let's play another game. However, little Tess pouted and replied with a grimace, no. You always brag to me that you can carry a lance to and fro on the battlefield, but now you can't even catch up to a little girl. That was when I was still young. While the old king was defending himself, he saw a guard rushing over. Little Tess did not know what had happened, but usually, a scene such as this had signified the end of her playtime. Thus, little Tess rushed up and pushed the guard away. This be asterisk starred is always disturbing my playtime with daddy. However, while she was trying to push him away, little Tess caught some of the guard's words. Words like, letter, and, northern dragon. Then, she noticed her father's gloomy expression. Little Tess, go and practice your lute. We can play another day. Following this, her father got up and left. Although little Tess was angry, 
based on her experience, it was useless to act cute at this time. Therefore, she could only vent her anger on the guard. She threw a fist at the guard. The guard was already prepared. He saw little Tessa's fist coming at him. He skillfully opened the chain mail on his upper body. This was so that little Tess's fist would not land on the hard steel. The situation is very serious. After reading the letter, the old king let out a long sigh. The letter was sent by the northern lord, Ardarian. The contents of the letter mainly said that there were two dragons of at least ancient dot level in the north. One ancient dragon was already a difficult enough threat, but now. There were two of them. If they were to ignore them, Long Song Alley would undoubtedly become a lost cause. Long Song Alley was one of the most important copper mining cities in the kingdom. If it was destroyed, it would have a huge impact on the kingdom's finances. The production of weapons would decrease, and the distribution of copper coins would also be restricted. Moreover, it would have a great impact on the morale of the army. After all, the continent had just been unified not long ago. What he needed to do now was to stabilize the situation. The old king put down the letter and said slowly. With my authority as king, I hereby order all the lords of my kingdom. Gather your troops. We are going to war.